see our cord. Did you, uh, did you look over those questions at yeah, all? I did. Okay. They all look, uh, if I can't answer those, we're in deep yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I felt like it was kind of a good flow where we'll sort of start with, you know, a little bit of who you are, and then we'll move towards yeah. some of the company. But then I'm, you know, I'm thinking about this from the perspective of a, of a possible investor. Uh, what are the kinds of things that they want to know that are unique that they don't get in just a normal pitch? Right. And I think... A lot of it's they want to know, you know, who are, who are the folks behind this? What makes them tick? And right. and in your case, um, you know, you had your choice of things. Why why this? Um, so I think some of those will be useful. And then for the broader picture beyond just money, um, you know, maybe we'll talk a little bit about what else, who else, what else might be helpful uh, as people are, are listening. So sure. All right, I'll do. A, quick intro and I can filter out if we get any noise or anything like that um, a little bit later in the post-production. Hi, I'm Tobin Arthur with Innovation for Alpha, a podcast sponsored by Angel MD, And I am joined today by Mike Ricci, who I've come to know over the months uh, is an entrepreneur leading a company called Spect. And it's a very interesting company and Mike's a great guy. And I'm uh, really pleased to have you, Mike, today, just to spend a little time talking about yourself and the company. So thanks for joining me. Pleased to be here, Tobin. Let's jump in, Mike. Um, just give a little bit of background to our audience. Uh, what, you know, what's your career been like? Yeah, so I have perhaps a little bit of a unique career for this space. Uh, I am a double E by nature. So you think, what's a double E doing in this space? Uh, when I started out altruistically, after I graduated from college, I wanted to connect the world. I spent the first portion of my career doing communications technology, wired, wireless of all forms, uh, sold one of my companies, migrated into senior management roles with CEO of a company that I sold a little over a decade or so ago. Um, and when I did that, I stood back and said, what do I want to do next? I wanted to sort of make a career change. And I looked at a lot of different segments and I realized that while I was excited, I'd connected the world. I looked at what's being connected, a lot of social media, a lot of other things that smart devices are being used for. And I said, hey, maybe there's a better use of all these platforms now that half the planet's connected. And so I went into specifically digital health and mobile health and um, started a company early on with a friend who was a doctor. I have quite a few friends, a brother who's a doctor. So medical, medical space made a lot of sense. Uh, we were fledglings. We did, created a technology company that connected people. We really, you know, were unique, didn't understand exactly how it worked. And it was a great learning experience. It also got me my CTO who went with me to another partnership with another friend doctor. And that one actually is now at a C round. It's doing quite well. And it is a mobile app that does physical recovery, physical, um, um, therapy for those who need it and it does it using ai machine learning on your phone on your smart device and it's getting great traction uh and then um what brought me here i actually decided at that point i was going to just consult and just help young companies grow and i met a company called spect and i initially really liked the team i liked the mission and started consulting with them. And as time went on, I ended up doing more and more and sort of migrated to a COO role with the business plan, same thing I've done for my other companies. And uh, got pretty excited about it. And then I was somewhat surprised a year and a half ago when the one of the co-founders, they made me a co-founder because I've been there three years. I was early on in the company. Uh, decided to finish his ophthalmology degree or his residency and asked me if I'd run the company. Glutton for punishment. So here I am <laughs> running the company having a great time and quite excited about where we're headed. That's cool. It's a, it's a good journey. And uh, have you always been from the Bay Area or was that because of career at some point? Uh, grew up in Southern California, went to school up here in the Bay Area, have been here for all but three years in Austin, Texas. Uh, went with the company I was working for there and came back, but pretty much been a Bay Area for the majority of my life. Got it. Um, maybe just give a little semblance of your, you know, hobbies, family, kind of stuff outside of work? What are what are your interests besides uh, what you're working on? Sure. So um, got a family of four, which is huge these days. <laughs> Didn't seem like that when I had them. Uh, and uh, my hobbies, I am an avid amateur swimmer. So I won't say I'm 
pro level, but I swim pretty regularly. I can, you know, go in and do my workout. It's a good way to meditate and get your brain clear. I love uh, amateur photography. I've done some trips to great places in the world and done, you know, pictures. I know you can do a lot of it on an iPhone, but I still like carrying my lenses around and all that stuff. Uh, and then we had a lot of theater in our family, so I'm pretty much of a theater fan, hoping for that will come back, uh, more live theater than anything else. That's very cool. So those are kind of, kind of my three things that I, I do in my spare time. You'll be, you'll be disappointed in, the, in this experience, speaking of, you know, sort of photography and live things. A uh, years, number of years ago, we took our kids who were even littler at the time. We were driving um, on a trip, and so we went to Zion's National Park, and my wife wanted to show the kids this national park. And we start driving through the canyons and my daughter, the oldest at the time said, mom, when are we going uh, to get out of here? She said, well, we've just gotten here. It's beautiful. We're gonna explore around. She said, you know, look at all the beauty. And she said, mom, I can see all of this on the internet. And she goes, well, honey, you know, look at how the sun hits the rock. She goes, mom, I can literally pick any time of day and get that particular photo angle on the internet. And my wife and I thought, oh, crap, this generation of kids are doomed. Um, yeah, it, it's still a challenge. You have to sort of appreciate the beauty of nature. COVID's helped with that a bit. I think we're all sort of yeah. appreciating things a little more. So. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about specs. Um, you know, tell, talk a little bit about the origins of the company you mentioned um, uh, the team that, that you ultimately took over for. But uh, tell us how it came about. Yeah, so uh, one of the things I love about the company is the mission, which is to prevent blindness. Um, turns out the same co-founder who's finishing his ophthalmology residency had a grandfather in India who treated many, many patients for a disease called diabetes, which we all unfortunately know about. And one in three Americans is either diabetic or pre-diabetic, sad statistics. And uh, his grandfather used to have people come to the back of his uh, home after the clinic and check them for eye disease, and he created this clunky little camera that he used to do that. And so being that uh, Ankur, our co-founder, had a buyer degree in engineering from Stanford, as well as a medical degree, he came up with this idea of let's attach an iPhone to it. So that was several years ago. And that same product has now evolved to what we have today. Um, so cool technology, cool mission in terms of really trying to save um, diabetic retinopathy as a crippling disease, those who know about it. If it's not caught early, Good news, if it's caught early, it's treatable now, very treatable, 98%. If it's not caught early, it, it leads to blindness or you know, near blindness. So it's one of those things you wanna catch early. I like the mission. I like that it was targeted at primary care where it can be caught early versus a limited number of eye specialists. And I really like the fact that I think they had the right mission figured out in terms of how to do this to make it inexpensive, ubiquitous, easy to use. Uh, and workflow. One of the things I've learned in my three digital health star pros, it's all about clinical workflow. You've got to figure that out. A lot of people come out of tech land, think exciting, sexy technology. It doesn't stick if you don't understand the medical world. It just doesn't work. And the sooner you figure it out, the better. You really need to understand how to make it work in a clinical environment. Well, that's, that's a great point. And you and I have talked about um, that shift in getting the care down to the PCP versus the specialist. Talk a little bit more about that. How do you see that playing out? What's kind of been the reception to date? And how do, how do the specialists, you know, how do they receive this given that they're going to get more filtered patients ultimately as a part of this as well? Yeah, we've had great, great excitement and acceptance. So primary care is looking to improve the quality of care. They're looking to improve reimbursement, which it turns out because ID exams are just not done in primary care, they get the benefit of either being paid for it as a service, they improve their quality scores, which is a big deal. Uh, and they also can uh, develop a good referral network to S specialists. We're not replacing a specialist, we're screening. We're not pretending to replace a specialist. Our device is quite good, but it's not meant to replace a $100,000 camera in their office. It's not meant to replace you know, the high-end fundus or even certainly not OCTs. So from that standpoint, they like it because they can improve quality of care, it's reimbursable. And the referral network, the ophthalmologists, they wanna treat patients, they don't really wanna screen for this disease. So we actually sort of give them hot referrals in of people they already know they need to see. So they like this network as well. So walk us through um, how this plays out in the PCP's office in terms of does this become part of a standard exam, this, this diagnostic, or are there indicators that would get them to, 
to test this and then maybe go the one next uh, one step further in terms of how are you envisioning building out that PP, PCP you know, network? Yeah, so it would fit in a standard exam. Matter of fact, the, I think the beauty of our technology, and once again, it's an iPhone with a lens and it's really, we're a software company more than a hardware company. We actually license the hardware with the software. So you just pay a monthly fee and you get used to the device. Uh, the beauty of it is it's very easy to use. And so it's designed for the same person who takes your blood pressure. We sort of coin it the stethoscope for the eye. It's meant to be quite easy to use, takes maybe 15 minutes of training by an, an untrained person. Like once again, somebody would take your blood pressure. Um, we do all of it basically turnkey. So we actually have in the cloud, somebody who's communicating with them with the device, capturing the images and sending a report back, all done by us. So virtually from the primary care physician, Usually the doctor doesn't see this at all. It's usually their staff that does it. And once again, it's done at the same time you would take stats. So very easy to do. Uh, it takes about a minute to do an exam, maybe up to two. Um, you know, we just make it really lightweight and it just fits into the flow. And then going forward, we are initially started by doing lots of smaller clinics just to prove efficacy and, ad and adoption. But we're now focused as we were in the business plan on larger scale enterprise. So we're focusing on large scale primary care clinics or networks or systems, healthcare systems, where they can use this as part of an overall structure. What, um, as you've gone out and been testing this with, as you said, the smaller clinics, et cetera, what have been some of the things you've learned? Uh, what's worked, what hasn't worked so far and, and maybe you know, caused you to modify what you were thinking about, if anything? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things I've, I keep relearning, but I walked in knowing this is after my two of these startups, once again, it's all about empathy and understanding every little potential speed bump along the way of really listening to understand how it works within the clinic and making sure you really, because the doctor may love it, but if the person who's doing the test thinks it's awkward, it'll not get adopted. It, it absolutely, the way it works and in, 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 they will listen to their staff because they need their staff. So we've learned to fine tune it. One of the key learnings came about from COVID and that is we were launching right around when COVID hit with the idea of being in clinic and guess what, no more in clinic. And so our largest customer actually is at home. They're a large scale national network. And we had envisioned in clinic that we'd say, okay, tell us who you're gonna to screen tomorrow because you have all your appointments set up and we'll sort of prep for it since we do all of it kind of on our end. And they said, well, you know, we just don't know. We just go out and we screen. And so we became rogue, as we say. We can just screen whenever. We have people on call. We have a way of knowing it. We say, we'll cover these hours. Whenever you need to do screening, we'll do it. And it's worked. And it was actually great because it was probably the most challenging environment. Plus, these at-home networks, a lot of them are in very challenging areas with demographics where patients don't get regular health care. And so they are really tough patient population. So we've also had to deal with that in terms of just making sure that everything we do works in that population as well. And I'm proud to say right now we're getting north of 95% of the time we take a screening, we get a screening, which is unheard of in terms of anyone who's trying to do this. Uh, so I think we're quite unique in that space. Well, um, you mentioned a few minutes ago, the process on the back end. So mm -hmm. as the diagnostics happen, talk a little bit about the process, you know, or how much intervention handholding is there on your team's end versus the, the system doing the yeah. work? So today, uh, you would call a human in the loop. We have what's called a navigator, you can call it a spec specialist, who actually knows ahead of time because they get a signal, they log on, and they communicate with the person doing the exam. Once again, usually it's the first time because it's kind of muscle memory. You're really just pointing a light in the eye. The person doing the exam sees nothing on the device, so they don't know anything other than just pointing in the right direction. We capture it, we see the images, we do everything. Uh, that same person will actually capture the images when they see they've got it in the right place and then send it to our staff of eye specialists to grade it. They have AI assist, so it'll take a minute or so to grade. What we're doing going forward is we're using computer vision to automate that process. We will likely still have a live individual, but it'll be more if you need it for backup. Computer vision will capture the videos automatically, so we'll be sure that they're of good quality. And then over time, we will also do full AI grading of the images. Having said that, we will 
almost undoubtedly always have an MD sort of QAing the process because we've learned from the medical community that while people love AI in the medical space, it should augment your care, not be your care. It should be medical people overseeing it. So we will give them uh, an AI report that will be 99.9% .9 of the time they'll agree with, but we'll have somebody just verify it before we send it. That makes sense. Um, let's talk about some of the um, tactics or, or tactical things that you're working to accomplish this year. So uh, maybe relate this to capital that you're raising, how much, uh, and then tie that to milestones that you're working to achieve, particularly over the next 12 months or the balance of this year. What are the key things you want to accomplish with that capital? Sure. So we're actually just capping off uh, our seed fund, which is uh, almost closed within the next 30 days or so. Uh, and our focus right now is using that funding to add a little more staff, um, build out the C-suite a little bit, uh, bring on a sales exec. I've been doing it all, which is fine. I've got background, but it'd be good to have somebody who comes more steep in that background. Uh, we have a few more people to add on development, on support. Um, so it'll be sort of building that out. The other key objective for the year is to close uh, a few more what I call logo accounts, which are accounts that like the one we have, which uh, I'm not sure I have the ability to do a press release on this podcast for, but it's a tier one account that has a very large backer and a number one tier one payer. Uh, close a few more of those just to prove the scalability of the product. Um, we will work on sort of the cost reduction methodology. I mentioned the computer vision piece, which is actually already in progress. More just to drive unit economics down because while we have this pretty well nailed now, over time we're going to want to get the human element smaller just to drive unit economics. Um, and then what we'll focus on later this year, pending market is a series A raise to really scale things up to the next level. And that'll be pending on market conditions and where things are with COVID, which are hopefully heading in the right direction. Right. When you, so on the balance of this seed round, and then obviously this can shift a little bit, like how much is left in the seed? Um, can you oversubscribe? Um, and then relate that to what you're thinking about later in the year. Yeah, we're, we're open to a little over subscription. We're actually already a little bit over what we originally planned to do on the seed, but we're open to a little more. We're willing to do that now just to add a little bit more fuel. Um, so we, we're hopefully very close to that. We've gotten some really top tier and we've also had original investors come back and we were a Y Combinator company back in 2017. So we got a combination of small angels and some larger names and a number of those larger names have come back and reinvested. Uh, we just closed another major investor that I'm getting a press release from, so I'll let you know on that one as well, uh, who has a lot of background in AI. So that's actually a nice technical advancement. It's a good validation. Uh, so we're, we're, we're in pretty good shape with this one, but we would probably look for a little bit more oversubscription just because of the amount of work we want to get. It's all about scale this year. It's all about scaling it up. And yeah. so I want to make sure that I'm funding the company properly and not starving in any way. We've been a pretty frugal startup up to now, and now's the time to hit the accelerator. Yeah, makes sense. Um, why don't we just talk a little bit about uh, two things to kind of wrap this up technically or tactically. So we recently did a, a readiness evaluation, as we're calling them, but we had the uh, AngelMD expert network. Typically, about two-thirds of the participants in these evaluations are, are physicians, and then afterwards, we uh, look at what kinds of insights. Were there any things that came out of that evaluation that um, not necessarily were surprising, but things that might be actionable or help you either tactically or even just in the way you present the story? Absolutely. Very valuable tool. We had the benefit of having a dozen or so clinical and other experts look at the material. And the key message, if I were to bring it up a level, is just messaging. So there are quite a few things we just realized we can be a little crisper on. Uh, even value prop things about the value. You asked about the value to the to the eye specialist, to the ophthalmologist, making that clear. Uh, making clear how we're differentiated because we had a number of people said, oh, well, can anybody do this? Well, truthfully, there's no product out there like ours that combines something that's easy, low cost, and high quality that guarantees the kind of results we're getting. People are trying to, to attack it from a hardware side where they're using very expensive portable equipment that really doesn't work well. Maybe half the time you get a successful screening. People are attacking it purely from the software side on AI, but they don't have any hardware. So you have to buy an expensive camera. No primary care clinic is gonna buy an expensive camera. They don't have capital, they don't have people. 
So you really need to kind of understand that market. So some of that messaging that came back was really useful because even though we knew it, we clearly hadn't made it clear enough in our messaging. So um, there were a couple areas I think that we thought we needed to maybe brush up a little bit more on just making clear on the business plan, how it works, how it scales. But to me, it was more about the messaging component. Good. Well, and I think that, you know, for all of us, we tend to hear our own message a lot. So sometimes useful to get that uh, right little bit of objective. So if you fast forward, you know, one thing I, I think investors, you know, first of all, appreciate the thoughtfulness around the company and the depth that, that's been applied, you know, your experience and background um, and the mission of this business. If you fast forward five years, um, and look back on this, what does success look like? What will you have hoped to have accomplished, you know, for yourself, the, the, the founding and managing team, the shareholders, however you, you might think about that? What's the goal here, you know, both personally as well as yeah. uh, for the business? Yeah, I have actually, it's kind of multifaceted. Um, as I said at the beginning of the call, uh, I personally wanted to sort of bring some of my learnings to the team as well. It tends to be a very bright, talented, but younger team. Very skilled, very good at what they do, very committed to what they do. And so some of the learnings of how we work as a team and how I can sort of mentor the team has been very fulfilling. Um, just looking at the mission of the company, I haven't talked at all in this call about sort of the longer term vision, but right now there's a great opportunity in doing eye screening, not only in terms of you know preventing blindness, but it's a good and very profitable uh, segment. But as we capture this data, and particularly because we're doing it in a unique way with video clips, we're capturing vast amount of data. And it turns out the retina is actually being pretty well researched as a biomarker for a number of other diseases. It's a fascinating structure, I would argue behind the brain in terms of fascination of the human body. It's really just an incredible organ. Uh, and the fact that you can gather that data will make the data we're gathering extremely valuable. So I think longer term, the, the company has great potential that way. Um, to me, to be able to look back on that and say, we created a company that had a philanthropic mission of preventing blindness, which is, you know, I threw out the number of one in three Americans, there's 400 million diabetics in the world. This problem is not getting better. So we can have a huge impact on the health of the, of the planet, basically. And at the same time, we can create what I think is a very exciting business plan. And when this data gets captured, I think the value of this retina data can help with numerous other disease states, pharma, the payer side, in terms of really creating uh, insights into how we can cure other diseases. So I, I think it's a very exciting story that has tremendous upside on the business aspect and tremendous upside in terms of what we can do um, kind of to help the planet. That's and the cool. People on the planet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what um, if if folks wanted to uh, learn more about the company? Uh, is there a website? Um, where would you direct them? Yes, there is a website that I will tell you up front is fairly stealth. We are building it out. We're going to do some press release as soon as we close uh, some of the seed. But it's called uh, GetSpec. G E T S P E C T. dot com. So www.getspec.com spec like spectacles uh you'll see that website is um is is not uh once again it's fairly shallow and stealthy but anyone who wants to reach out to me directly and i'm assuming tobin we can give him my email as a result of this as part of the link yeah. feel free to reach out to me directly and i'd be delighted to have a call with you probably a zoom call for now until we can meet in person pretty soon uh and just tell you more about the company what we're doing the mission for the company whether you're an investor or whether you're just somebody interested in what we're doing We'll put uh, we'll put a link to the uh, website, and then as these new announcements are ready, we'll update the show notes to include those links to make it easy for people. Um, in addition to capital, what what kinds of, of folks that might be listening to this could be helpful? Are there other things that that you would need introductions to, or that could help facilitate um, expediency? Yeah, so certainly if, if this goes out to the Angel MD network, which you're part of, any introductions you have relative to opportunities, always welcome. We find a lot of our best opportunities come from our, our clinical advisors. We actually have about 40 in the company now that are advising the company. So anyone in this network that knows of leads that we can go speak to would be very valuable. Anyone who can afford talent our way, the talent we'll be looking for, once again, sales, which I'm actually just embarking on that search right now. 
uh, and then anyone who comes with more uh, software probably isn't as good a fit, but we already have leads on that as well in terms of just building out the technology. You know, one last thing it, it made me uh, think of as you think about leads. So who ultimately, as this company matures, who, who ultimately would be a, a good buyer for this company to, to take it to the next level? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I have thoughts. It could be, it could go one of several ways. You could go all the way from a pure tech giant like an Apple or somebody else who's getting, as you know, very deep in healthcare. The whole purpose of the watch is healthcare, right? So an Apple, uh, hell, an Amazon, the way they're going. And I could also argue it could be a big pharma because once again, the value of this data to pharma, you know, it's all data when it comes to pharmaceuticals in terms of their research. Um, and I would argue one other segment could be the payer segment, not necessarily to buy it outright, but certainly to endorse it in terms of how it could be helpful in that segment. Because once again, the cost savings alone of avoiding these eye surgeries, it's, it's huge. So. I love it. Well, Mike, um, is there anything else you can think of that you might want to share that I didn't ask? Um, I think you've done a really good job. Um, you know, we're excited to, uh, to have the interest. We're excited to be part of the Angel MD network. It's already been very valuable to us in terms of the connections. Um, I think just kind of blending the medical background with some pretty strong tech background we have as well gives the company really good backing. And once again, we have quite a few advisors. Those who think they might want to be an advisor to the company as well. Once again, we, we have quite a few, but we're always looking for more. Uh, let us know as well. Great. Well, Mike, it's uh, always a pleasure. Uh, we think very highly of you and, and SPECT, um, two of our, our favorites and, and the combination is even better. So thanks for taking some time today, just sharing a little bit. And we hope to continue to get the word out and uh, get people to know a little bit more about the company and, and encourage people to lean in in whatever uh, area is of interest to them. So thanks again. And we'll, uh, we'll follow up with the links and everything so that people can reach out. Thank you, Tobin. Always a pleasure. Okay, Mike, take care. Take care.